أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين. Now tonight we discuss the sources on Al Mahdi عليه السلام and specifically tonight we speak of some verses of the Quran. Of course, when we come to hadith, I think the, the traditions are so abundant that we cannot cover them. Uh, probably what we will do, we do not cover the traditions which directly talk about Imam Mahdi alayhi uh, salam. As I said, because there are too many, we just talk about some other traditions which imply that there should always be an Imam. And uh, basically, uh, we cannot be without hujja, and that, of course, we have plenty of these traditions in both Sunni and Shi uh, sources. So we may, may cover some of them, but now today on the Quran, one question always is asked: Why there is no mention of such very important personalities or concepts in the Quran? Uh, why? If the Shia say that Imam Ali was appointed by the Prophet, peace be on him, why his name is not mentioned in the Quran? If Imam Mahdi is so important as a person in the whole Islamic theology and thought, why his name or at least just an allusion to the concept of Mahdi is not made in the Quran? Now, Quran, you know, is a very stylistic book. It speaks in a very stylish language. It doesn't usually directly allude to think. It's a spiritual book. It tells you that you have to pray, but it doesn't tell you how many rak'ahs a day, when. It just gives a hint, from when the sun goes uh, inclines from the middle of the sky towards the night, you pray. But it doesn't say really what time, how many rak'ahs, how to pray. Is more important than prayer in Islam? No. as salatu amududdin. Salat is the pillar of the faith. There's nothing more important than that. But you see there is no mention of the, the way you have to pray, how many rak'ahs, how many sajdas, what to say in your ruku, what to say in your sujood. These are left for the Prophet, peace be on him, to explain. وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرِ We have sent down to you this reminder. لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزَّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ You have to explain to them what I mean by these verses. So it's very important that the Qur'an cannot be separated from the Prophet, peace be on him, or from his sunnah, or from his traditions, explanations, interpretations. It is impossible to do that. And therefore, if we find a, an authentic explanation of something in the Qur'an from the Prophet, peace be on him, in our sources, we have to stick to it. Now, the question might, uh, of course, come again that, okay, you say about salat, you say about zakat, the Qur'an doesn't say how much zakat you have to pay, or it, the Qur'an talks about imamah, of course. The Qur'an talks about wilaya, إِنَّمَا وَلِيُّكُمُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا الَّذِينَ يُقِيمُونَ السَّلَاةِ وَيُؤْتُونَ الزَّكَاةِ وَهُمْ رَاكِعُونَ Your wali is prophet and the messenger, and those who pray and pay zakat while they are uh, bowing down in Ruku. But it doesn't specifically mention the name. But this concept of uh, Walaya, if it's mentioned, the person of it is so important that there should be a mention of it in the Quran. Uh, we can see that according to our interpretation, of course we have different interpretations, different understanding, according to our understanding, Shia understanding, we see that when the verse number three in Surah Al Ma'ida was revealed, Ya Ayyuhar Rasul, sorry, verse number three is Aliyum Akmal Tulakum Dinakum Wa Atmam Tu Alaykum Ni'mati. 
وَرَضِيتُ لَكُمُ الْإِسْلَامَ دِينًا Okay, we say Prophet said this is meant, what was meant by this is that wilaya has come now. The person is specified. And then the verse comes, يَا أَيُّهَا الرَّسُولُ بَلَّغْ مَا أُنزِلَ إِلَيْكَ فَإِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلْ فَمَا بَلَّغْتَ رِسَالَتَ Convey what is revealed to you. If you do not do that, you have not conveyed the Rasal as you have conveyed nothing. All the revelation up till now you have conveyed will be vain and waste if you do not convey this last message that I tell you. Now, we, according to our interpretation and our understanding of the history, about 100,000 companions of the Prophet were present. And the Prophet, after the revelation of this verse, took Ali's hand and said, Man kuntu mawla fahada aliyun mawla. And it's abundant in all sources, Sunni and Shi'i sources. However, after the Prophet, no one took heed of that. They interpreted it in a different way. Now, suppose the name of Ali had come in the, in the Quran, that's, Innama waliyukum Ali. Okay, we accept that. Innama al-Khalifa ba'da al-Rasul Ali. For example, okay, what do you mean by Khalifa? Like Adam was a Khalifa, Ali is a Khalifa, but not a political reader, for example. I mean, there's always room to interpret things. This is not a right way to determine what should Allah say in the Quran, what shouldn't he say in the Quran. He knows what he, what he should say in the Quran. And then, if, if Muslims did not take heed of what the Prophet said, then... How could it be safe for the Qur'an to remain intact if, for example, people did not want this verse to be there, did not want Ali to, to, be, a, to be the Khalifa to the Prophet, peace be on him. And, of course, Allah says, إِنَّا نَحْنُ نَزَّلْنَا ذِكْرُ وَإِنَّا لَهُ لَحَافِذُونَ We keep, we protect this dhikr. However, we protect it, of course, in the ways that we know. And one of the ways of protection is that we do not send, we do not put things in it which would give incentive to people to tamper with it. Maybe. This is according to our understanding. Anyhow, if there is something definite, if there is an interpretation of a verse from the Prophet which definitely tells us that what this verse is alluding to, then we have to stick to it. No matter whether the verse has explicitly and clearly has, has spoken about that thing, or in a subtle way. Because both Sunni and Shia believe that Quran has subtle meanings as well as apparent meanings. Inna lil Quran batunun. There are, there is a subtle meaning in every verse. And for, un, beneath that subtle meaning is another more subtle meaning, and so on and so forth. Now, the verses which are mentioned about this concept are, of course, in Shi'i sources they are more abundantly mentioned as the ta'wil of some of the verses of the Qur'an. And, uh, Numerous verses in the Holy Quran has been interpreted as pointing to the emergence of Mahdi alayhi salam. Some have put number of these verses to exceed 500. Now you might say, where are these verses? We read the Quran every day or every Ramadan. We don't see these verses. However, many of them are esoteric ta'wil of the verse rather than its clear indication or implication. It's not something that we can actually understand. If the Imam has said that, for example, this is alluding to the time of Mahdi, or this is alluding to Mahdi, then we say, okay, this is a subtle meaning, we do not understand it, the Imam has, understood, has conveyed to us this subtle meaning. However, there are four verses which are considered to be more explicit in this regard, and, uh, of course, uh, by a sort of... Uh, rational analysis of the verses, we would realize that they should allude to something which has not yet happened and is going to happen in future. What are these four verses? The first verse is, uh, 
arsala rasulahu bil huda wa din al haqq li yudhhirahu ala al din kulli it is he who has sent his apostle with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may make it prevail over all religions now the implication is clear that we do not see during the history that this religion of truth has ever prevailed over all religions in all parts of the world because the verse is very absolute in its indication that this should prevail over all other religions now this statement uh, has been repeated three times in the quran verbatim, verbatim that just this this statement which is part of a verse is not a complete verse this statement has been mentioned four times three times in different verses with some nuances of course in the other parts of the verse now in reverse order these verses are why in reverse order because the exegetes when they have discussed the verse they have discussed it in the first place when it it has uh, appeared which is surah to toba however the f- one place which is uh, uh, which the statement appears in, in surah to saf yuriduna la yutfu nur allah bi afwahihim wallahu mutimmu nurih walau karaha al kafirun huwa alladhi this is the statement huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa din al haqq li yudhhirahu ala al din kullihi walau karaha al mushrik they desire put to, to put out the light of god with their mouths but allah shall perfect his light now this is the the emphasis that when will allah shall perfect his light was it perfected at the time of the prophet that means did the whole world benefit from this light or this is going to happen later on in future though the faithless should be averse it is he who has sent his apostle with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may make it prevail that allah make it prevail over all religions though the polytheists should be averse this is the last place in the quran where this verse has appeared uh, i have made this slide is very in 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 a in, in a quick haste so there are some problems here uh now the the, the other praise uh, in is in surah fath huwa alladhi arsala rasulahu bil huda wa din al haqq li yuthhirahu ala al din kullih and then the remainder of the verse is different wa kafa billahi shahida it is he who has sent his apostle with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may make it prevail over all religions and the first place where it appears in the quran is in surah tawbah yuriduna an yutfu nur allah bi afwahihim now this is more emphatic wa ya'ballahu illa an yutamma nurahu walau karaha al kafirun and then huwa alladhi arsala rasula they desire to put out the light of allah with their mouths but allah is intent on perfecting his light nothing can prevent this that allah will per- will perfect his light as i said some might may interpret this as well at the time of the prophet this happened allah perfected his light by giving whatever instruction was necessary to the prophet peace be on him however all these troubles dissensions various directions that the muslims went if the light was perfected if the guidance that allah wanted really prevailed why all these differences misunderstandings fightings battles among muslims one battles of companions against each other ali peace be on him fighting muawiyah fighting talha fighting zubair why this confusion if the light was perfected why this confusion was there now uh, 
Let's see what Sayyid Qutb has said in his tafsir fi zilal al-Qur'an. Uh, maybe most of you have heard about Sayyid Qutb. He was one of the leading intellectuals of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And uh, he was executed because of his somehow extreme ideas and some people today say that he was actually the inspirer of Al-Qaeda and other groups who took arm to fight against injustice. However, he was a vociferous intellectual against injustice and wanting Muslims to prevail. And in his tafsir you can see this, the way he speaks about this verse. His tafsir is fi zilal al-Qur'an, in the shade, under the shade of Qur'an. He says, the Muslims realized this promise initially. So, this is a promise. So, the promise means it comes afterwards. He says, initially, during the era of the Prophet and the four caliphs, and those who came after them, for a long time, Muslims realized this. Islam prevailed, and it's... Its light was glowing very brightly everywhere in the world, but later on the Muslims retracted and retreated and gave way because the enemy grew strong. However, this is not the end, and the promise of God still holds, and it shall come true. Now, he doesn't say anything about Mahdi or whatever. He says that this should come true. This statement cannot fail, because if it fails, the Quran has failed. Isn't it? If the statement of لَيُظْهَرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينَ كُلَّ fails, the Quran has failed. So he says, it still holds. Now, he was a politician. So he thinks in terms of power. And power, yes. If you want to talk about power, Muslims for several centuries did have power. But was their power based on guidance and light of God? or based on killing, massacring, fighting among each other in the, at the time of Banu Umayyah, at the time of Banu Abbas, afterwards, can we really say that Muslims had realized this and did they? I mean, the Crusades proved that at least they were, they were equal in power, the Christians and Muslims. There were lots of victories and defeats on both sides. So you cannot say that they real, really realized this and they were victorious. If you speak in terms of power for some time, for, in some areas of the world, yes, that's true. But if you speak about light of God, we do not believe that many things which happened in the history of Islam were really guided by inspirations, by divine inspirations, so to speak, by guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we know that there was... At the same time, there were three big Muslim kingdoms, the Fatimids, the Abbasids, and uh, the Umayyads in Spain, and at some times the uh, Buwayids in, in Persia. Four big Muslim powers were fighting against each other. Which, were, which one of them were the light of God being perfected? You cannot say that. Okay, this is what Sayyid Qutb says. Fakhruddin uh, al-Razi, my favorite Ash'ari theologian. I say my favorite because he is really one of those people who scrutinizes concepts, hair splitting in every aspect. If you, and that's why he's... Uh, he is somehow hated by Ahlul Hadith, saying that he brings lots of these uh, discussions, which are philosophical discussions, into Kalam. And also, of course, he is uh, dubbed as Imamul Mushakkakin, the Imam of everyone who, who doubts in everything. Now, this is a 6th century theologian and Mufassir. Now he provides a deeper analysis of the verse in his Mafatihul Ghaib. This is his tafsir. He says, prevalence over something could be by proof, 
or through abundance or by dominance. Now, when Allah says, لَيُذْحِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينَ كُلِّهِ What does he mean? Does he mean that he gives so much proof that all other religions are defeated in terms of proof? Or it means it gives you so much abundance in population that then everyone, every other religion would fade away compared to Muslims? Or does it mean it gives dominance to Muslims? What does it mean? Then he says that uh, prevalence by proof did happen at the time of the Prophet. And it didn't need a promise. Because the very person of the Prophet was the dominance of proof. So this doesn't need a promise for future. Therefore, what is left as the fulfillment of this promise is other, other types of prevalence. Now, uh, he gives five possible interpretations for this prevalence. The most plausible of which is what he reports from Abu Huraira. I don't want to bore you with other inter explanations which he gives. They are not very plausible, but this is the most plausible. From Abu Huraira and from Suddi. Suddi was a student of Ibn Abbas, uh, uh, a Mufassir from the Tabu'un. He says that Ruya and Abu Huraira radiyallahu an, annahu qal hadha wa'adun min Allah, bi annahu ta'ala yaj'alu al-Islam aliyan ala jami al-adyan. It's reported from Abu Huraira that this is a promise from God to make Islam prevalent over all religions, and this will only be realized fully at the advent of Jesus. And as Suddi has said, that this is realized at the ad advent of Mahdi. No one would remain but entering in Islam or paying tax. Now, when we come to the time of Mahdi, we would discuss that we have in many traditions that still the Jews will be Jews and Christians will be Christians. Not, it's not the case that everyone would enter Islam. This, this is very interesting. That these religions are going to, to go on and on until the Day of Judgment. Even at the time of Mahdi. What the verses and the traditions tell us is that then everyone would be subordinate to his rule. And if they do not convert to Islam, they pay jizya, they pay tax. Whether we accept these traditions or not, we will analyze this when we come to the time of Mahdi salam, what happens at his time and whether Jews and Christians and other religions. What we have is that he gives security to all to have their own thoughts, their own beliefs about God. And, uh, but he cannot force people, of course. He can dominate, but he cannot force la ikraha fi din. You cannot force hearts. The hearts could not be forced for religion. And this is what as Suddi says in a tradition, that everyone would either enter Islam or they pay tax. Of course, this is somehow contradictory with some other traditions which say that Islam would enter every house. As I said, we, would, we will analyze this later on, inshallah. Now, this... This type of interpretation is uh, the dominant interpretation of the verse in both Shi and Sunni books of Tafsir, of this verse. That لَيُظْهِرَهُ عَلَى الدِّينَ كُلِّهِ means at the time of Mahdi However, there are, at the time of Umar uh, and you know, many people claim to be Mahdi especially Mahdi al-Abbasi, for example, and we had other Mahdi's from Zaydis as well, they claimed to be Mahdi, and since they were fighting, people were trying to deny even the concept of Mahdi. Therefore, there are some traditions which say, La Mahdi illa Isa ibn Maryam. There is no Mahdi except Isa. We believe that there is a fulfillment at the end of the time, and as these verses say, but it is only Jesus coming, there is no one else from Ahlul Bayt. Now, this contradicts the mutawatir traditions that we have. However, here you see Abu Huraira doesn't say at the time of Mahdi, he says at the time of Isa, and the Khuruj Isa. And they are together, I mean Isa and Mahdi are together, but we have some of these traditions coming like that. 
this view is the view of almost all exegetes from Ahlus Sunnah regarding this verse, that this will be fulfilled at the time of Mahdi or Isa salam. So there is no argument about the implication of the verse, that it implies that something should happen in the future. It hasn't happened yet. Those who say this happened at the time of the four caliphs, and then it ceased, and we have to wait for it again, they just do it out of respect for the four caliphs. Otherwise, how could it be possible that the companions, some companions come and murder Uthman, and some companions fight against Ali, and still we say that the, the religion has prevailed at the time of the four caliphs. Now, we have to pass this because these, these, these are those five interpretations that I've not translated because I don't want to bore you. Uh, many exegetes have reported the following hadith as an explanation of this verse. Warawal Miqdad, is Miqdad, the famous companion of the Prophet, قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم لا يبقى على ذحر العرض بيت مدر ولا وبر إلا أدخله الله كلمة الإسلام إما بإز عزيز أو ظل ذليل مقداد says I heard the prophet saying that no house or no tent would remain on the earth unless Allah would bring the faith of Islam into it either by dignifying an honorable person, a Muslim, or by humiliating an abased one, anyone who wants to defy or fight against it, Allah will humiliate them. He either dignify them by making them a Muslim or humiliate them by forcing them to submit to it and pay jizya or whatever. I said then the religion would be totally for Allah. This is the Tafsir of Baghawi, a 5th century Sunni scholar, who has brought this under the verse. And he says this hadith is reported by Ahmad ibn Hanbal and ibn Habban and ibn Manda and many other traditionists. There are ample hadith and arguments in Shi'i sources referring the verse to the time of Mahdi. There is no disagreement about Shi'i exegesis that this verse refers to time of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. For example, uh, Sayyid Hashim al-Bahrani in Tafsir al-Burhan mentions a hadith from As-Saduq from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam fi qawlihi azza wa jal huwa alladhi arsala rasoolahu bil huda wa deen al-haq. والله ما نزل تأويلها بعد ولا ينزل تأويلها حتى يخرج القائم. I swear by God, Imam Jafar Sadiq says, the interpretation of this verse has not come true yet and will not come true until the قائم comes forth. This is the standard view of all the A'ima, and we will see that all A'ima have mentioned this, that this verse, the ta'wil, because ta'wil has different meanings. Sometimes ta'wil means the realization of something. So, hal yandhuruna illa ta'wilah, do they expect, but the ta'wil of all these things that we say about the qiyamah means, do they expect, but the realization of all these, it will come true. And when we say the ta'wil of this verse will not come true, it means it is not realized, it will not be realized until the time of Qa'im. Tabrasi in Majmu al Bayan. Of course, usually we say Tabarsi as a wrong Mashhadi sort of pronunciation, but it's Tabrasi. Tabrasi in Majmu al Bayan reports from Ubada al Asadi that he heard Ali alayhi salam saying after reciting the verse, and this is a very well-known hadith from Amirul Mu'mineen. When he recited, هو الذي أرسل رسوله بالهدى ودين الحق, Ubadah says, I asked him, أذهر ذلك بعد, has this been realized? Because we did not see this happen. It was all 
wars and fightings and all these things going on. He said, sorry, Amir al Mu'min, after reciting this verse, asked Obada, sorry, I. I mean, we say, as Obada Azahara Dalaka Badu, do you think this has come realized? And people who were there around him, Kalu Nam, Kala Alayhi Salam, Kalla. No, this is not true. Fawaladi Nafsi Bayadeh, Hatala Tabka Kariatun. Has this come true yet? They said, yes. He said, nay. I swear by the one in whose hand is my life, it will not come true until no city is left unless. The witness to La ilaha illallah is called in it in the morning and in the evening. That means Islam should be universal. This is the ta'wil of this verse. Also, Allah Majlisi reports from Abu Basir, who said, I asked Imam al Sadiq regarding this verse. And he said, I swear by God, the ta'wil of this verse has not descended yet. It means Allah has not decreed that this should happen yet. I said, may I be your ransom, when will it descend, the ta'wil of it? He said, when the qa'im rises, inshallah. That is when the ta'wil of this verse will come. Okay, this is the first verse. It's very clear. You, you go to any tafsir, Shia and Sunni, they say this, And you remember in the uh, previous session or the, the first session, we talked about the views of uh, Rashid Rada. And all his discussions were actually around this verse, trying to say that what all the exegetes have already understood is wrong. And that shows that there was no disagreement about the exegetes, that this is the meaning of the verse, alluding to the time of Mahdi a.s. Okay, the second verse. وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْعَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمُ الْوَارِثِينَ This is in Surah Qasas. And we desire to show favor to those who are abased in the land and to make them imams and to make them the heirs. This is of course about Banu Israel. And to establish them in the land and to show Pharaoh and Haman and their hosts from them that of which they were apprehensive from these Mustafafun. We show them their own and Haman from these Mustaz Afun, something which they were afraid of. Now you might say, well, this is very clear, it's, it's about Banu Israel. Why do you uh, say that this might allude to the concept of Mahdi alayhi salam? Because it is a continuous irada. Our continuous will is based on this, that anyone who is abased and have right to prevail. And right, of course, in Allah's meaning of right, not in our meaning of right, we will help them. And of course, because here Musa and Harun were abased, they prevailed, and Banu Israel prevailed with them. It was not because Banu Israel, it was because Musa and Harun. And therefore, Many traditions from the Prophet and from Ayyama say that this is not only about Banu Israel. Quran runs through generations. And this is a continuous irada from Allah. That anyone who is abased, anyone who is mustada'af, is trodden down, we will help them. Of course, if they are pious, not if they are oppressors themselves, if they come up. Now, روي عن أمير المؤمنين عليه السلام أنه قال هم آل محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم. These is reported from أمير المؤمنين that they are these مستضعفون are آل محمد. Allah will send their Mahdi after their hardship and will honor them and humiliate their enemy. 
This is what Allah does. Now, in many verses of the Quran, you will see that things which are about regarding the past history, I must say, this is about us. For example, in the Quran, we say in Surah Anbiya, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا What is the verse? Uh, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلَكَ إِلَّا رَجَالًا نُوهِ إِلَيْهِمْ فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُ We, before you did not send any messenger, unless they were men, like you, like them, and we revealed things to them. They shouldn't think that angels should come. This has been our sunnah. The men came with messages. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ Go and ask these people who have books. the Jews, the Christians, asked them. They had prophets. Were they prophets, not men? فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرُ أَهْلُ الذِّكْرِ Here are Christians and Jews, أَهْلُ الْكِتَابِ However, the A'imma said, نَحْنُ أَهْلُ الذِّكْرِ We are أَهْلُ الذِّكْرِ It doesn't mean that the apparent meaning doesn't apply. It means that when Allah says, فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ أَهْلُ الذِّكْرِ The more subtle meaning is that anyone who has knowledge, go and ask them. And we have knowledge. And therefore we are Ahlu Dhikr. And therefore when here Amir al-Mu'mineen says, نُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُطْفُوا These are Ahlu Muhammad. It doesn't deny it with regards to others. Any prophet in the past who was oppressed or mustadhaf, Allah would have helped them. And therefore here, Allama Tawatawai, on the uh, line of other Shia exegesis, uses a concept, a term, which is very interesting here. It says this is membabil jariyah. It means that it is an instance of it. It runs in this as well as running in other instances. And here when Amirul Mumin says these Mustafafun are Ala Muhammad, No one should come out and say, well, this is against a clear indication of the verse. No, yes, that's true. The indication of the verse is about Banu Israel. But it runs in Ali Muhammad as well. In future, in present, it runs in them. So this is the meaning of whom Ali Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And also, At-Tusi, Shaykh At-Tusi in his tafsir, At-Tibyan, Rawa qawmun min ashabina. إن الآية نزلت في شأن المهدي أجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف. شيخ التوسي says in this in his تفسير that a group of our scholars have reported that this verse is revealed regarding مهدي and that God will show him his favor after he is abased, abased in the sense that he is overpowered by others and he cannot do anything and will make him a dominant imam. and will give him all that is controlled by the oppressors. And in Nahjul Balagha, now this adage in Nahjul Balagha is very, very interesting, and it is widely reported. It's not only in Nahjul Balagha, in many other books, the adage is reported. Adage number 209. وَقَالَ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ Very beautiful, of course, as we expect from Amir al-Mu'mineen, the standard of eloquence is completely clear. I mean, you can realize, this is Nahj al-Balagha, this is not other hadith. لَتَعْطِفَنَّ الدُّنْيَا عَلَيْنَا بَعْدَ شَمَاسَهَا أَتْفَ الذَّرُوسَ عَلَى وَلَدْهَا وَتَلَى عَقِيبَ ذَلِكَ عَقِيبَ ذَلِكَ وَنُرِيدُ أَنْ نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْعَارْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ الْوَارِثِينَ The world will tend back to us. after its unruliness, like attendance of a rowdy camel to its child. The world is somehow simulated to a rowdy camel which has run away from Ahlul Bayt and said it will come back like this camel going to its child. Then he recited, and we desire to show favor to those who are abased in the land and to make them imams and to make them the heirs. Now, uh, the, as I said, this tradition has been reported widely through several chains of transmissions. Commenting on this hadith, Ibn Abel Hadith, who died 656. This is, a, this is a very standard date because that's the downfall of the Abbasid. That, that's the downfall of the 
whole Islamic empire, isn't it, by, by Mongols, so 656. And the same year he passed away, and he was the last Mu'tazili scholar. Of course, there were later on some Mu'tazili scholars in Yemen and other places, but they were not prominent. This is the last prominent uh, Mu'tazili scholar, and it's very ironic. I laugh whenever I think about it. The Mu'tazila went away, disappeared, as the Islamic Empire disappeared. In the same year, the last Mu'tazili scholar passed away. And of course, he was arrested several times. Holaku wanted to kill him, and Nasiruddin mediated. He didn't let him to be killed, and lots of different stories he had. Now, commenting on the Hadith, Ibn Abel Hadith, the Shafi'i Mu'tazili commentator of Nasir al This Shafi'i Mu'tazili commentator is is very unique in his love for Ali. You can see this in his commentary on Nahjul Balagha. Wherever it comes to Ali, whenever he talks about Ali, you see love coming out of his pen, really. He says that uh, the Imamiya, that's us, believe that this is a promise from Imam Ali regarding an Imam who is in occultation and will dominate the earth at the end of the time. However, the scholars of our school, that's Mu'tazilis, believe that this is a promise regarding an imam who will rule the earth and conquer all kingdoms. Now, an imam for them, of course, is Mahdi, which, of course, is not in occultation, is not yet born. That's, of course, the, uh, the view of all Ahl sunnah And also, we have... Uh, Iman al-Akhbar al-Saduq and al-Hakim al-Hasakani al-Hanafi fi shawahid al-Tanzil. Now, I think we have to break for Salat and uh, maybe we leave these for next week. I don't think we can finish this this week because then we have question and answer. So we have a couple of more verses to discuss. Maybe we leave it for next session. Not... Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين. If you allow me, just we continue with these uh, few verses for a few minutes, and then, uh, inshallah, we have time for questions and answers. Uh, I was saying uh, regarding this second verse, ونريد أن نمن على الذين استضعفوا في الأرض. There is a tradition reported from Imam Jafar al-Sadiq alayhi salam and this tradition is reported by both Saduq in Ma'an al-Akhbar and al-Hakim al-Hasakani who is a famous Hanafi traditionist and uh, he was contemporary of Sheikh Tusi. He has a he has a book dedicated to whatever is revealed about Ahlul Bayt in the Qur'an, and that is Shawahid al-Tanzil. Fi Qawa'id al-Tafzil li Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam something like that. We will see the full name of it. It's, it's famous as Shawahid al-Tanzil. Now, Mufaddal, the famous companion of Imam Sadiq, Mufaddal ibn Umar, he says that uh, I heard Ja'far ibn Muhammad al-Sadiq saying that, uh, let me go to translation directly, we don't have much time. Uh, the Prophet, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq said, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at Ali and al-Hasan and al Hussein, peace be on them, and cried and said, أنتم المستضعفون بعدي. You are the abased after me. And well, of course, we know that this came true, isn't it? Well, about coming from the reverse order about Hussein, we know how he was a mustadaf. About Hassan, how he was a mustadaf, peace be on them. And about Amir al how he was a mustadaf. Those people who paid allegiance to him, fought against him. So what type of essays are more than this? You are the abased after me. Now Mufazal didn't understand what does this mean, that 
the prophets told Ali and Hassan and Hussein alayhi wa salam, Antumul Mustad Afuna Ba'di. I asked, what is the meaning of that? The Imam said, it means that you are the Imams after me. And this, this is uh, somehow uh, very difficult to, to understand because Mustadaf, what's the, the relationship between Mustadafun and A'imma? Then Imam brought this verse that's, وَنُرِيدُ أَنَّمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً Mustadafun, of course, the righteous Mustadafun, this should not be forgotten. The righteous Mustadafun will be made A'imma. Here, uh, the Imam said, it means that you are the Imams after me, for Allah the Almighty says, and we desire to show favor to those who are abased in the land, and to make them Imams, and to make them the heirs. Now, let's go to the third verse. The third verse which is usually mentioned is in Surah An-Nur. وَعَدَ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مِنْكُمْ وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَيَسْتَخْلِفَنَّهُمْ فِي الْعَرْضِ كَمَا اسْتَخْلَفَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ وَلَيُمَكِّنَنَّ لَهُمْ دِينَهُمُ الَّذِرْ تَضَى لَهُمْ وَلَيُبَدِّلَنَّهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ خَوْفِهِمْ أَمْنَا يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرِكُونَ بِشَيْئَةِ وَمَنْ كَفَرَ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ Now this is more, this is clear is indication. Let's look at the verse. Allah has promised those of you who have faith and do righteous deeds that he will surely make them successors in the earth just as he made those who were before them successes. And he will surely establish for them their religion, which he has approved for them. And that he will surely change their state to security after their fear, while they worship me, not ascribing any partners to me, as the pure Tawheed will be established. And whoever is ungrateful after that, it is they who are the transgressors. Now, look at this emphatic surely is here. There are six letters of emphasis here. This is very amazing how Allah has put emphasis on this promise. Layas takhlifannahum. This lam and noon both are for emphasis. Layas takhlifannahum. And then layumakkinanna. Lam and noon again. Layubaddilannahum. Lam and noon again which are letters of emphasis. Look at the six emphatic letters used in this verse. Three lambs and three noons telling us that this verse surely has not been fulfilled yet. Because this surely is, means that it will happen and we haven't seen this happening. So surely this verse has not been fulfilled yet and it should be fulfilled later. We certainly cannot regard the Umayyad or the Abbasis or the Ottomans or the Safavids to be the fulfillment of this promise. Nowhere in the history of Islam we could see this promise to come true. Therefore, we should seek the fulfillment somewhere else. Now, uh, one possible interpretation would be that the promise was fulfilled at the time of the prophets and the first four caliphs. Okay, what did the verse say again? It said that uh, uh, Allah has promised those of you who have faith and do righteous deeds that he will surely make them successors in the earth. And he will surely establish for them their religion. And he will surely change their state to security after their fear. Now some say, well, this fear and security is relative. I mean, they were, not, they were insecure in Mecca, they became secure in Medina. And therefore, or then they returned to Mecca in security and conquered Mecca. This is the fulfillment of this verse. But I think this is playing the implication of this verse down to a great extent. This verse is very strong. It says that we will put, of course, Alladina. That's very important because we did not see the Umayyad kings or Abbasid kings or Safavid kings or being Alladina Aman wa Amilu Salahat. They were not that righteous that the verse is talking about. That is why the verse has been interpreted in Shi'i sources to allude to the time of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. 
Now, Tabrasi argues for this view, the, view, the Shi'i view in Majmu al-Bayan, that why we say this verse is only fulfilled at the time of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam. He says, after reporting a hadith from Ubay ibn Ka'b regarding the cause of revelation of this verse, and speculating about the land, the Arz, mentioned in the verse, whether it is Medina or Mecca or this world or a whole dunya or next world or Akhara, he says, uh, this world as a whole, a dunya or next world. Because Ubay ibn Kaab says that we, when we were in Medina, people were attacking us from every side. We did not put our arms down. And we were very insecure. And then we said that would it be possible that there will be a time where we could securely have our faith, practice our faith, and no one would attack us? Then this verse was revealed. And that meant that, yes, Islam prevailed, and Muslims were in security. However, it might be true about this part of the verse, لا يبدلنهم من بعد خوفهم أمنا but whatever, what about يَعْبُدُونَنِي لَا يُشْرَكُونَ بِشَيَا They only worship me. They do only righteous things. This we do not see as a, as a whole in, in Muslim history. Now, this is of course the method of Tabrasi in Majmu al -Bad. He brings all views from all Tabu'un, all companions, Sunni scholars, Shia scholars, and then he gives his own view. Now, look what he says. He says that there is a hadith from Ubay ibn Ka'b in this regard, and there are different views whether this land make them successful in the land in Medina or in Mecca. Arz, of course, is earth. However, it might allude to a particular piece of land as well. Or some people say it means that after they were insecure in dunya, they will become secure in akhirah. It says, let me just go to translation. There are disagreements about the meaning of the verse. Some believe that it is specifically revealed regarding the companions of the Prophet. Some like Ibn Abbas and Mujahid, his student, believe that it is generally true about the Ummah of Muhammad, peace be on him. However, what is reported from Ahlul Bayt is that it is about Al-Mahdi from Ali Muhammad. And uh, he continues uh, saying that Ayyashi, the, one of the ancient exegetes, has reported from Imam Ali ibn al, al, al Hussein, Zainul Abidin alayhi salam, that after reciting this verse he said, I swear by God, these are the followers of us Ahlul Bayt, those, those who will be successors. God will bring this truth for them on the hands of a man from us, who is the Mahdi of this Ummah. He is the one about whom the Prophet said, if even one day is left of this world, this is a unanimously accepted hadith by all Sunni and Shia scholars, if even one day is left of this world, Allah will prolong that one day until a man from my household would govern, whose name is as mine. He will fill the earth with justice and equity after it is filled with injustice and oppression. Now this is what Imam Zain al said. Uh, and like this has been reported from Imam al baghir and Imam al-Sadiq, Tabrasi says. And, uh, then he, con he continues saying that, and this meaning is the one on which the pure household, al itratu taira has consensus. And their consensus is abiding proof because of the statement of the Prophet, I leave with you two precious things, the book of God and my household. They do not part until they meet me at the house. Now, this is again a unanimously accepted hadith. He, he brings the argument that no one from Ahlul Bayt has given any other interpretation from this verse. And since they are with Quran all the time, they know the interpretation, and therefore this is the true interpretation that this will happen at the time of Mahdi alayhi salam. Moreover, he continues, the establishment in the earth has not taken place fully in the past. And hence it should be expected in the future, because Allah shall not break 
his promise and it should be fulfilled fully. Al Hakim al Hasakani, the Hanafi scholar we mentioned before, and Al Hafiz al Qunduzi al Hanafi, uh, another Hanafi scholar who is more recent scholar, died 1294, Islamic calendar of course, from Ahlul Sunnah have reported the same traditions in their books, Shawahad al Tanzil and Yanabi al Mawadda. Now, this Hakim and Hafez, just to give you some acquaintance with these hadith terminologies, this is of course. I mentioned just in passing, uh, terminology used by usually Sunni traditionists, not by Shia traditionists. A muhaddis is a person who knows traditions and is considered a scholar in the field. This is what we call a muhaddis. If a muhaddis knows 100,000 hadiths with their chains and is able to analyze them, of course not in memory, you, there were people in the past who knew 100,000 hadiths, who knew it by heart, and all the chains of transmission, nuances in the chain and these things, but these are very rare. Someone who has actually collected these traditions, 100,000, and has uh, the ability to analyze the chain and the text, is called Hafiz. Then after that comes al hujja is a muhaddis who knows 300,000 hadiths in the manner above. Now you might say, did Prophet actually speak this much? 300,000 traditions. We know that the traditions which have come in Sahih, Sahih books are, if we put all of them together, would not exceed 30,000, 40,000. So there were abundant in traditions which were not accepted. However, they were recorded later on, and they were collected. And uh, those of which were, those traditions which were not collected because they were very weak, they were reported uh, from heart to heart. Al-Hakim is a muhaddith who knows all the traditions. There is no tradition that he is unaware of. That this we call right al hakim al Nishaburi example, who, who wrote Mustadrak al Sahihin. Now these two men that I mentioned, these two scholars, one Al-Hakim Al-Hasakani, now you, you know why we call him Hakim, because he was aware of all traditions. And Al-Hafiz Al-Qunduzi, of course his uh, scholarly degree was a bit slower than Al-Hakim. Now the fourth verse very quickly, وَلَقَدْ كَتَبْنَا فِي الزَّبُورِ مِنْ بَعْدِ الذِّكْرِ أَنَّ الْأَرْضَ يَرِثُهَا عِبَادِيَ الصَّالِحُونَ In Surah Anbiya, indeed my righteous servants will inherit the earth. Certainly we wrote in the Psalms, we wrote in the Psalms after the Torah, indeed my righteous servants shall inherit the earth. Now, the argument regarding this verse is, uh, is more clear, whatever, because there are different interpretations of Zabur and Dhikr. Some say that uh, Dhikr is name of God after giving the most essential part of belief, that's Tawheed. Then we wrote in Zabur that there will be a savior at the end of the time. Or Dhikr, the most common interpretation is Dhikr was Torah and Zabur was Psalms. That means after we mentioned this in Torah, we mentioned it in Psalms as well, and well, by implication in all other books of prophets, we mentioned that the righteous servant shall inherit the earth. Now, the implication of this verse, as I said, is more clear. Analyzing the verse, one would realize that an issue that Allah mentioned in previous books, as well as in the Quran, well, this is the mention of it, isn't it? should have been a very important revelation of alluding to a very important event. The earth shall be inherited by my righteous servants. The exegetes have mentioned different meanings for the earth and for the righteous servants in this verse, like the earth being the paradise and the righteous being the Muslims or the earth being their land conquered by Muslims in their historic battles, which is of course 
uh, not very pleasant interpretation. However, the Imams have given the ultimate ta'wil of the verse. Shaykh Tusi again in Tabian, fi tafsir al ayah, in the explanation of this ayah from Imam al Baqir alayhi salam, this is a promise from God to the believers that they will inherit the whole earth, not partly concurring parts of the earth. And this is not regarding Akhirah, this is Tunya. And also Tabrisi again. Uh, in Majma al Bayan reports from Imam al Baqir that these are the companions of Al Mahdi. Again, this is Jari, this means it runs as the more clear instance in companions of Mahdi alayhi salam. Al Hafiz al Qunduzi uh, has reported from Al Baqir and Al Sadiq alayhi salam that Al Mahdi and his companions are meant by the righteous servants in this verse. Okay, that's it.